Okay, let's let's get started. Um, obviously, if you're in TV land, there are plenty of seats here now. Okay, at this moment, you're probably less likely to catch COVID in my class than in the dorm room you're sitting in. So uh, I encourage you to uh, go and uh, join us here. Um, hopefully, we'll get some people are in transit. But uh, um, okay, let's start off uh, first of all with. Uh, I guess last class there was a discussion of, uh, uh, you know, um, my, my student Fahad and Charuta were uh, here uh, talking about the uh, machine learning type stuff in Python. Any questions or comments about that? Did they do a good job? Do a bad job? Okay. Okay. If you have any feedback I should relay to them, let me know. Okay. Good. Good job. Okay. Um, next step is to ask about, uh, did, first of all, I guess the previous class I was talking about data cleaning, okay, which happens to be something I really kind of like. Any comments or questions about that? I know that was a week ago, and, uh, but we haven't had a chance to chat about it. Good. Um, um, at this point, I'd like to open the floor to uh, discussions of the homework. How many people have started the homework? Okay, it seems the people in here have started the homework. In TV land, I'm guessing you guys have started the homework. Are there any questions? No, not have started the homework. Any questions about, um, about the homework assignment or discussion? I like discussion about such things. So there are some uh, missing values in the test data itself. So should we impute those values as well? So the question I think what you're saying is is that there is a null value in the in the uh, for some of the in in the test data. Should you impute that as well? Well, let's think about it. Okay, what are your choices? Okay, so the reason why we imputed missing values in the um, training data was, it was that uh, we wanted all of records to be to build a model from it, and um, you know. We, we didn't have so many records that, or, that we felt great about throwing out these things. Now, is it fair to impute the um, value, missing values in a, in a test data? Okay. It should be fair to impute everything except the label that you think it's going to be. Right? If you're trying to predict a label or you're trying to predict a regression value, then obviously imputing that and saying, wow, look how good I did imputing it isn't important, valuable. But if your model works by, if there's missing values, impute something, then you should presumably do that in the test data as well. Okay, you're not cheating at that point. Okay, and that's what the main concern would be mucking around with the testing data. Are you cheating? Okay, and I don't consider that to be cheating. Uh, when you want to impute the data and training it, uh, there is a choice for us to, you know, uh, randomly pick some distribution of the training data. Okay. We can randomly select one of the values from the distribution of the data and impute them, right? And randomly. Okay, so there's different imputation. Okay, hold on. There's one. Okay, um, one of the imputation methods is again this question of what is the right I guess the, the big question is what is the right imputation method for this uh, it's more like uh, the imputation like uh, the distribution of the training set is different from the distribution of the testing set right so if you want to replace the missing values with the mean, the mean okay so your question now is if I'm going to impute something from the training set okay and let's say I was going to use a random selection of imputation should I use the value from the training set or not? Okay. I guess one way to deal with this is to put it to a vote. I have an opinion. But what do people feel? Okay. Is it better to, should, should you, when you, let's say you're using, doing the imputation then, should you use the values from the training test set to help you or just from the training set? Okay, someone with a hand. No one with a hand, just mumbles here. 
Yeah, I think that the training set is a much better thing to work from because, uh, you know, first of all, in a normal world, the, the test set should look like the training set. But to be fair, it's kind of a world of, you know, stuff that you know when you're building the model and then you're deploying it. And that maintaining that separation seems like an important thing. Okay, so I would not use... A, you shouldn't use what you learned from the what, what's there in the training set, in the in the test set to help you with the training. Yeah. So there are certain features which are categorical features, and some categories take up almost in the, or ninety percent of the data set. So what should we like, how should we like take something out of it? Okay, so there's questions here about. Um, I gather you've got some categorical data. You want to know about how do you deal with categorical data? And what you may be saying is that you've got, you said you've got 90% or one class. And I'm going to guess that there's how many different classes are there? Okay, so, so there's a lot of classes that are very, very rare. Okay. Now, how could you deal with that? Okay. Does anybody have any proposals for how you might deal with something like that? You're not talking about a categorical data where you've got a lot of classes, but one class that's overwhelmingly dominating it. Any ideas of things that might be reasonable to do, either in TV land or here? Uh, yeah? We can uh, like analyze for each category different, differently. So we'll know that how much the particular category is different. Okay, so your suggestion there was to break it down by category. One possibility might be in an extreme let's say would be to, uh, you know, break it down. Maybe you had, um, you know, what, what was the category, by the way? OS version. Okay, let's say it was operating system version. And let's say that everybody has Windows, except a small number of people have Mac and a few crazies are running Linux, and there's probably some other crazies who are running, you know, um, bare metal or God knows what else they could be running. How would you do it? One possibility is to, in some sense, build a different model for each class. You could say Windows people are different than um, Apple people, okay? And maybe there's a model for Windows people and a model for Apple's people. That's a perfectly reasonable thing. The trouble with that, what are problems with that? Okay, yeah. So, the, like, uh, or if, or if you're taking a Mac model, then the data set is very limited. So, it won't print. so then the problem is, is that for the small class, there probably isn't enough to, to be used. And if you have a big majority class in many small classes, then certainly these very small classes don't aren't worth their own model. You may not have enough support for them. So any other reason ideas of what might be done? One idea that I might say is you can sometimes um, classify things into the majority class and other. Okay? So it could be that you have there are Microsoft people and then Mac people and Linux people and bare and other weird thing. Or you could say there's just Mac people, I mean, Windows people and weird people. And you glump the others together. And an advantage of that is that, uh, that, that you have more tra enough training examples, let's say, that now that minority class is big enough to do something with. I don't know if that's true in your particular case. But certainly if you come up with a world of, like if you were looking at political people in the United States, you have Democrats, people who vote Democrats, you have people who vote Republican. You have a modest number of, of, of crazies who will vote, uh, crazy is the wrong word, who will vote Libertarian or Green. And then there are a tail, a long tail of parties, okay? Till you'll you'll find people that you know some parties that only ten people will vote for in the entire United States or something like that. Probably in that case, it's better to glump a lot of these guys into an other category, and they may have more similarities as an other than anything else, right? Okay.
And it could be that one way to do it, again, like I said, I, I'm right now thinking big class and other is typically the easiest way to glump them. Any other ideas on how you might process a data set? Or, in, or any uh, questions about uh, the, the homework or anything like that? There may be some questions on the chat that I'm not seeing because of how I'm dealing with this. Okay, I'm seeing comments, but not uh, questions. Any other questions about the homework? Yes. Um, and then we related with the class we are going to predict. So how much difference can we say that it is significant that we can say that it is really affecting the prediction? Okay, so there's a question of, I think what the question is, and I'll get to you in TV land in a minute, so don't uh, stay there. But the question was about um, something about how do you know whether a, a feature is important enough to include in your model? That's basically what I think what you're saying. You could imagine a world where um, I've got, you know, I've got 50 features and I'm going to include all of them. <laughs> okay. Or it could be you're saying, wait a second, many of these features are irrelevant, right? There may be something in that thing about the thing about which computers are likely to be hacked, and one of them may be what color is the outside of the box painted. Okay? And maybe something like that doesn't really tell you very much. So what can you how would you 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 think about these kind of things? Well, um in machine learning, first of all, there's this concept of regularization that uh, we'll talk about later, where um, you will sometimes want to build models and punish them for using too many different features. You punish a model for having errors. You also punish a model for having too many features in it. Okay? And therefore, then, in order to really want to include a feature, it's got to, the model, the, the machine learning procedure has to be convinced that this mod feature is worth it. Okay? So one possibility is you, you use, if you were doing machine learning, you would use a regularization method. And we will talk about that later. Um, another possibility is you eyeball it and you look for what are correlations with, um, with your target. And it may be the things that, that you say, well, let's first try to build a model with the X most important features scored by, let's say, something like correlation with the target. And then I build a model with bigger sets of features. Hopefully, the one that is going to score that, that with, with more features will do a little bit better on your training set. But that may be because of overfitting. Okay, and that's sort of a danger that you have. Um, what could you do about that? Well, maybe if you have enough examples, a good thing to do is to have a training, take your test set and split it into two parts for your own purposes. One would be for training, and the other is for evaluating your model before you go on the real test set that's supposed to be hidden to you. Okay? And then you can judge basically, well, how much better does my model get when I add more features, okay? And you might very well be happier with a simpler model that uses less features but does 98% as well on the test case. It might well be more robust, you know, when you do it on the real application later, okay? Okay, uh, question in TV land. Um, so what? Uh what criteria would we, it, how would we be able to say, justify removing an outlier from a data set? So okay, so how would you, when would you consider, what would be a justification to remove an outlier? Now, there are a couple of possible just, first of all, from the, is there justification to remove an outlier from your test set? Almost certainly no. That's there. God put that th there to show that your model isn't perfect, right? Now, on your training set, does it pay to eliminate an outlier? Well, one possibility is um, this is where, again, having a, you know, kind of a validation data set 
is probably a good idea in general. And again, whether we talk about for this assignment is a separate question, but we're getting experience. One, one possible question would be, what happens if I take all my I, I, I want to delete the outliers and just spit the rest of the model. How does that do on my validation set? Okay. If the outlier, you know, if the outliers are so common that um, they're going to be in your validation set, then deleting them is probably a mistake because you're going to want to, you know, you're going to have to score against them. Again, the principle that I would be saying is when do you think a um, something is such an outlier that it's a mistake in the data? That's something you don't want. Where is it something that's just kind of weird? Okay. And it's one of these things that you've got to live with. Okay. And this is to a certain extent a judgment call. Now, I don't know anything about computer security, but what are you what are you considering an outlier? Just so I understand what you're thinking about. Uh, well, for one example, there's a during, while I was doing question three, there's a one computer that comes up that has 192 processor cores and something like 1.4 terabytes of RAM. Okay, 192 cores and 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 a lot of RAM. Is that an outlier? Okay, the answer is yes. Is that an error? The answer is probably no. Is it indicative of something? It is probably indicative of a really powerful machine, right? Now, you know, what would that mean? You know, it could mean that what you should be doing is, um, setting up a different class of if, if let's say these has specific properties let's imagine that there are really powerful machines that 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 government secret agents want to break into that's a different class of machine right that's different than you know they want to send spam from your pc okay maybe this is a different type of machine the other question when i hear about it being an outlier we agree it's an outlier now how much of an outlier is it and it may be uh something that is less of an outlier if you think of it in terms of logs and i'm now making this up by the way i'm not looking at your data set i'm never going to look at your data set okay my tas will grade it i'm never going to look at your homework okay but something like when we talk about how many ram there were how much ram RAM is something that doubles between one machine and another, right? There is something that kind of goes between, you know, um, how much RAM is on your phone? Does anyone know how much RAM is on a phone? What? 8 GB. And what is on your uh, laptop? 8 GB. 8 what? 8 GB. Same as the phone? Yes. Okay, that's interesting. Okay. <laughs> Now, um, I come from a world which would have thought the phones were less powerful, okay? Um, but there, there, it's often the case that, that RAM would be something, I think, that doubles from size to size, right? So if you want, you say, why does your laptop have 8 GB? It's presumably because you were too cheap to buy the 16 GB version, right? <laughs> And the reason you, you and, and you may have also had, did you also have a 32 GB version offered? No. Yeah, maybe not. Okay, I'm saying, saying, yeah. Certainly on desktops, I know, you know, computers get bigger. How much memory was on this macho machine that you were talking about? Do you remember? Okay, I'm feeling cut off. It looks like we're cut off there. Are oh, people still... The, this, uh... How much memory was there on in the? Uh, uh, can someone type that in? Because uh, I'm not. The here. outlier had, I, I think. Okay. One point five million. Wait, one hundred ninety-two. Okay, GB. So this may have been something that if you took a log for one hundred ninety-two is kind of like uh, several logs. 
you know, so it's, it, it's like compared to your eight, that's 16, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 128.5. Maybe if you took the log of this thing, it might be a more effective feature and be less of an outlier. Does that kind of make sense? Actually, I'm saying the outlier had 1.4 terabytes of RAM. So we needed to go a couple more logs on it. So what's the consequence of that? If you try to fit a model that does something meaningful about RAM, if it could range between eight and, um, you know, uh, 140, is, no, uh, uh, a terabyte is a thousand GB, right? So this could range between eight and 1400. And there's one 1400 point out here. This looks kind of weird. Maybe if you hit it with a log, it's a more meaningful feature. Okay. So that, that may be another question about how you deal with it rather than, than throw these things out. Okay. Anything else? Any other questions or comments about the homework? I like having these discussions. I miss having them only the day of the, uh, before the homework is due. Okay. Um, let's see. So there's some things that are said to be unknown. One question on here. Primary disk type, sometimes it's unknown. Um, when it should usually be HDD or SDD. Should we remove those things or replace them? So imputing it would be trying to guess whether it has um, HDD, you know, a, a hard disk or a solid state disk, right? Now, why would it be unknown? Let's, but now then what I always ask, but before you do too much massaging on this, I would be asking myself, why is it unknown? Can anyone guess why they don't know whether it's a hard drive or a, yeah? It does not matter for the what? Okay, you're telling me that capacity for the hard drive doesn't matter. And I don't know enough about computing to know if that's true or not. Now, if I were going to break into a computer and I had one computer that had nothing on it and one computer that had the riches of the world on it, which one would I want to break into? Okay, in that case, the hard drive might matter. Do I believe that? I don't know. Okay, but it's not, you know, it's not immediately obvious that you could ignore it. What I'd be asking about is why is it sometimes unknown? Okay, and is it that unknown is something they just goofed? Okay, or is it that there is a systematic reason why it's unknown? So it might be a function of age. It might be a function of what I'm going to say a commodity system versus a, uh, you know, a home brew system. So I'm kind of imagining that, you know, you with your crummy eight gigabyte computer, okay, you bought it. I can tell it's from, I think it's from, no, it's from HP, right? And I think anyone who know, would know whether your drive is hard, if they knew it was an HP and they knew it was from the, your, you know, when you bought it, they probably know what's, what drive is in there. Now, if it's a, a server or rack sitting in um, a computer room someplace, God knows what it is. So in this case, maybe there is information in it being unknown. That is the difference between being a commodity machine and a homebrew machine. And so it may very well be that this is something that, uh, what you call it, are, uh, you know, are, um, you know, have or don't have something. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Again, the other thing that I will, these are interesting questions. These are the kind of questions one should, should it be thinking about at some level. I do warn people that, uh, you know, there's this philosophy called KISS, keep it simple, stupid, right? And I strongly encourage people to have a KISS philosophy about this. The first thing you should do is build a simple model that isn't asking these complicated questions. 
Then, after you've got the whole assignment kind of worked through to some level of satisfaction, that is a time to maybe go and obsess about some of these other matters, right? My guess is your model will get better the more you think about it, but there will be a law of diminishing returns. And what would be a bad thing is if you go and work out the details of whether something is unknown or hard drive and spend, you know, a, a lot of time dealing with that instead of dealing with more fundamental matters first. Okay? Any questions about it? So simplicity has a value, but uh, that, 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 that should be kept in mind it's first. Any questions about the homework? One way or another. Uh, yes. So on the backdrop of that question, how do we deal with that data? So we have a lot of unknown data uh, versus uh, we have the data which is given SSD and SVD. So do we replace it with the lowest value? Lowest possible value? So the question is unknown. One question is unknown missing data yeah. or is unknown a feature? Okay. So you could imagine in my again i kind of am going to believe again i haven't looked at this data set i don't know about it but my theory is unknown means it's a server in a room and you can't tell from just uh the web browser or something like that okay because i don't know how else would it get this information from okay i could imagine that that somehow there's some program I don't, know, I don't know where Microsoft got this data from, but my instinct is a lot of what it knows is probably, it knows a lot of stuff for commodity machines because there are many of them, but it doesn't know things about server type machines because those are more designed ad hoc type things. What fraction of, the, of them were unknown? So maybe it was around 30, 30 90%. 30%? 70 yes, percent was unknown. So would I use that to be, again, I, he's, I heard 70%. Would I try to figure out what it was? Probably not. Because, you know, unknown is, is maybe, a, there's maybe a good reason for it. Okay? That's my initial thinking. And certainly my first thing would not be to worry about it. I would be trying to go for the low-hanging fruit before I go for anything very complicated. Any questions? Okay, anything in TV land? Anything. Okay, let's see if I can do it. Hold on. Okay. Um... Okay, if there's nothing more about the homeworks, so I'd like to now, oh, wait a second. There's questions about, should I use one hot encoding for categorical variables? What is one hot encoding for categorical variables? One way to, to do it would be to say that um, we were dealing with, I was told about this class, this thing with five, four or five different classes. One way you could do it is turn that categorical thing into four or five different single binary variables. Is it Microsoft? Is it Apple? Is it Linux? Is it other? Okay? And that's what we mean as a one-hot encoding. What is good about that kind of variable encoding? Let's think about it. What's good about a one-hot encoding? Yeah? Okay, so what I think what 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 you saying is if you give it a numerical value, machine learning val, um, algorithms that come up with numerical weights for variables, things like linear regression, can do something with it. Okay? That is a good thing about a one-hot encoding. What is a bad thing about one-hot encoding? Yeah? It creates many columns, okay? And suddenly you need a large number of training, you know, a, a very large number of training data for it. 
What is a solution? Well, you have to use your judgment on something like this. And one argument would be you probably don't want one hot variables for very rare things. Maybe grouping things as others might be a useful thing, right? So that's that's kind of a that that seems like a a pot and and sometimes by looking at your variable, you might imagine um you know, uh, let's say we had a variable encoding um, job descriptions. Maybe the, your job description was you were a kid, you were a college student, you were a grad student, or you were an adult, okay, I mean a worker, okay? If we wanted to get down those number of classes, maybe college students and grad students are kind of the same thing. I don't know if you guys will, maybe you'll dismiss this, so no, I'm much better than a, an undergrad, okay? But you could imagine a world where sometimes it pays to combine these classes in a sensible way, okay? So sometimes that may be a good thing to do, okay? Like, for example, I'm going to imagine, and I'm just making this up, but I imagine that under your operating systems for the thing, there's probably 96 flavors of Windows, and 30, 13 flavors of Apple operating systems in that database. Is that correct? Okay, I mean, for some value of 96 and, and 13, right? Maybe you would want to encode those of the oper Mac operating people as one variable. And, you know, so, so exactly what the variables you use, ideally there's some level of judgment, okay? And those are kind of what I would say the issues are. Anything else? Okay. If not, I'm going to go on now. But uh, I think this has been a uh, reasonable discussion. Okay, so good luck finishing your assignment. Okay. What I would like to talk about now is um, uh, the topic of coming up with scores and, scores and rankings. Okay. Um, I think you guys encountered this in your assignment now. When we talk about rank the power of the machines, okay? Um, a scoring function is a, uh, a measure that reduces a multidimensional data set down to a single value with the goal of highlighting some property, okay? That's what a scoring function is. And a ranking is typically basically an ordering of the, of the, the items in your universe according to some kind of a scoring thing. And many of you guys are quite familiar with rankings in the real world, okay? Why did you guys go to Stony Brook instead of some other university, okay? I imagine that some of you it may have been, wow, I could have Skeena as my professor, but more likely it is the case that I got rejected by higher ranking universities, and this was the, the best one that accepted me. And that there was some canonical list of universities and Stony Brook sat, you know, um, 34th or 50th or whatever, whatever it was on that list. And that had that conveyed information to you. So you're certainly familiar with college rankings. Okay. Um, if you're in sports, there's all kinds of other sports rankings that people come up with. Who's the best tennis player? Where do tennis players rank? Um, they have a system for doing this. I was reading that some tennis player in some match was proud because he was sort of like 1596th, ranked 1596th in the world, okay? And that meant that there were 1595 better tennis players and, and everybody else was worse, okay? Um, you know, so, so rankings are, are useful statistics to have, okay? Um, any questions about that? Are there any other ranking areas where people care about? Okay. In sports, they come up a lot, and I like that example. But um, in you've probably read rankings of companies. Okay. What's the best company to work for? Okay. And I know you guys are thinking about that when you think about what jobs to take. Okay. Um, and the best one of these rankings was done by taking some kind of data set about the companies and coming up with a, some kind of an order. So I think rankings are a, a, a useful thing to do. Now, I um, 
one world to think about rankings that I think is quite informative is to think about what happens when it comes to giving grades. Okay? Now, I am going to, at the end of the year, rank all of you guys. You guys are going to be on a spreadsheet. I'm going to sort you by your final average in my class. And ones at the top get better grades than the ones at the bottom, right? And every one of you, I will know at the end of the semester, that person over there, he's 39th in my class. And she is 26th, and you are 128th, okay? What is interesting about course grading? You guys have had courses graded in many, many classes. You know, you guys have taken an infinite number of courses by now. What is interesting about grades? I think there's several things that are interesting. One thing that's true is that every professor that you encounter will have a different kind of grading system. You know, that uh, they will rate homeworks and um, exams differently. They will rate projects. Some classes will give you points for class participation. Sometimes they will take off for being late. Sometimes they will. Everybody's got a different way of doing it. Some people will curve the values before they compute the average. Some people will do all kinds of things. So what's interesting about grading systems, in my mind, is the following. First, they are very arbitrary. Okay, Every teacher has a different scoring system for how they rank their students. And every student teacher believes they're right. Okay, is my way doing better than Professor Bender's? Of course it is. Okay, and um, Professor Bender would presumably say the opposite, right? Okay, now why can we have different opinions on this? This seems like a pretty fundamental matter. We're trying to measure how good a student is doing. Um, one reason we get, can get away with this is that there is no validation data. There is no objective standard you can point to me at the end of the semester that said, I deserved an A minus in this class. You may cl claim it, and I hear people whine, and I tune it out, okay? But does everybody kind of get this idea? It's not like a typical machine learning problem. It's not like I have a gold standard of what grades there should be in um, my class. And if I knew what the grades should be, then maybe I would adjust the weights on how much I give each assignment so that uh, I, I do the best job giving scores like the ones that they the right ones. We do not have a validation data. Okay. The third thing that I think that's very important here is that the system, even though there is no validation data, I say that and even though Bender insists on doing it a different way than I do, somehow there is general robustness in the system, okay? Students generally tend to be an A student or a B student or a C student, okay? You, typically, you do not have students that are half B students that are half A's and half C's. Typically, all of the grades are kind of measuring the same thing. I mean, every, everybody has exceptions. They did better in some class and worse in another class. But generally, the reason, the reason is not because the professor was doing something weird about how they were doing the grading, okay? Students get basically similar scores on their transcripts, okay? And that's a sign that the general way that the professors are scoring these things must be pretty reasonable, okay? And so what I like about scoring functions is you can come up with an arbitrary measure that gives you something that is still very reasonable, even though you don't have a validation measure. Any questions about that? Now, sometimes what I call a scoring function, some people call st a statistic. That sounds like a better thing, right? A scoring function sounds like an amateur thing. But if you say, wow, I've developed a statistic for measuring how good students are in 549, that would be your, 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 your average in the class. Any questions? Okay. Now, again, the thing I'd like to emphasize is that there is a, um, a the, the difference between regression, okay, and machine learning things is that there is a gold standard. 
And in most, in many problems that you're dealing with, there is not a, a right answer. Okay. Now, if you have a, 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 a right answer, okay, then setting the weights on different variables to, to match that answer, that's machine learning, that's regression. Um, now, many things that people do with ranking, okay, if they want to do it in a scientific way, they try to get a gold standard data. So when you hear about ranking, what company does ranking for a living? Does anybody think of an algorithm company that when you hear the word ranking, what? U.S. News, okay, U.S. News is one. What? Say that again. Index. Index, uh, okay, stock index, you mean? Okay, maybe, I was thinking Google. Does Google describe what it does as ranking? Google ranks web pages, right? So a lot of people at Google will say, I do page rank, I do ranking of pages, okay? Now they're trying to decide for a given query, what's the order which you should show the pages? What's the most relevant to the least relevant, right? Now you could imagine Google probably started by doing this by setting up, okay, if a website has a lot of people linking to it, let's give it some points. If it mentions your document, your keywords many times, let's give it some points, okay? And you could imagine building a search engine where you construct that kind of scoring function by hand, right? Now, Google is a machine learning company. And these days, and in fact, probably from a very, very early point, the moment they started having users, they started obsessing, how can I figure out if my rankings are good, okay? And one of the things that they would do, for example, when they show you a web page of 10, the top 10 documents, if you click on the first one, Google says, yes, I gave you, did well, right? If you click on the third one, well, that meant, oh, I should have had this one first, right? So they do get feedback, and from feedback, you can build a machine learning model, okay? And that gets us into the same problem in my mind as any other machine learning problem, okay? But, um, but without training data, you have to make judgments, okay? Any questions? So let me look at a couple of ranking questions that are uh, of scoring function questions that I think are interesting. Um, one scoring function that I suspect many of you have heard of is the body mass index, the BMI. Is that, who here knows their rough BMI? Okay, many people. What is the BMI? The BMI is a score that was designed to capture, um, what you call it, uh, you know, what you're, how, whether you're over or underweight. The BMI is your mass in kilograms divided by the square of your height. Okay, that's a number, right? It takes two variables and gives me a number. Why do you divide the mass by the square of the height? Can anybody come up with a reason why the square is the right thing to do? Does it seem like the right thing to do or not? Okay, you're saying that in order to chop it down, well, if you want to just make the number smaller, you could divide by a million, right? And now it's smaller, but that doesn't do you anything. What is the, 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 the height squared? That's kind of like the area of a cross section. That's proportional to an area of a cross section. If they cut you in, you know, if they slice through you, okay? If they assume that you are a square, okay? Then the cross section would be the square of your height. Everybody agree? Is your mass proportional to the square of the height? Well, I don't know. For, you know, I would be thinking it would be proportional to the cube of your height, right? Because it's sort of your volume. Isn't that right? You know, you're made of stuff. That's what the scientists call it, right? 
and that stuff has a weight per cubic centimeter, okay? So it seemed to me that your weight should be proportional to your volume, okay? But people like, somehow people like the square better, okay? There's no real scientific obvious reason for that, okay? What is the interpretation of BMI? Well, what's nice about it is if you measure it in kilograms and the height in meters, you get a, um, what you call it, a, uh, you know, a, a number that's relatively interpretable, okay? You're normal up to 25, okay? Um, you know, when I did this book, I was at 22.8. I think I'm a little bit tall, bigger now, okay? But uh, I'm not obese. I know this much, right? I know when Trump was president, um, his statistics, suddenly at one point, he, he grew an inch taller. And why was that? That inch taller that he was reported, his, they reported his height as an inch taller. That was enough to move him from obese to overweight, okay, because, uh, on the BMI score. And there's some people who think that's why he started reporting himself an inch taller than he was, okay? Any questions about what the statistic is? I have one oh, question. Yes. Uh, so this is not just generally about like, you know, this is particularly about BMI, for example, uh, from what I understood and what I read about BMI was actually made to measure meat at uh, slaughterhouses. So I wanted to ask how is the statistic which can be easily applied to like us, for example, uh, people who are really fit and maybe really well built will still have a BMI above 25. But Okay, so this is a good question. Your, the, the claim, just so people heard, he said, first of all, he heard that BMI was originally designed for measuring something about cows at a slaughterhouse or something like that. Animals at a slaughterhouse. Could be. Okay. Um, and he's then complaining, wait a second, for athletes, this isn't quite, you know, it isn't quite right. You know, if you have an unusually fit body, you could imagine a world where I'm a weightlifter and every, you know, I have no fat on me, but I, uh, all I got is muscle, right? Am I going to get taller the more and more I lift? No. Am I going to get heavier the more and more I lift? The answer is yes, right? So does this do a perfect job capturing whether you're overweight or not? The answer is no. But when I asked the people in here how many people knew their BMI, a bunch of people knew their BMI. And it provides a rough gauge, and I, it, I claim it's a useful measure. There's a difference in life between useful and perfect, right? And that if you make it perfect, oh, well, you also should know something about how much you bet. You could imagine now thinking about a athlete, in a BMI, where now we include how much, how many pounds you could weight lift, okay? Would that be a more accurate model for whether you're overweight? The answer is yes. Would it be a more useful model? It's probably harder to compute this thing. They, every doctor's office would need to have an, a weightlifting set in it if they're going to compute this statistic. So the answer is it is a, a useful thing, but not a perfect thing. The great thing is that it is easy to interpret, okay? And it correlates with body fat. Um, the question was about athletes, and this is a figure I, I kind of like. I took a look at all the basketball players on the left, okay? And they, each basketball player you can get their, in the NBA, you can get their height and weight. I had football players, American football players, okay? And you can get their height and weight. And so I do here I do a dot plot of, of basketball players and football players. Um, colored by their BMI. Red is for normal, overweight is green, and obese is, um, is blue. What do you see here? Any, are there any interesting observations that people have? Yeah? Those football players, my God, look at them. They are animals, okay? You know, most football players... American football players would score as obese on this standard. Now, why is that? American football, it, it's, a, it's a good, great game to watch, but I mean, a lot of, there are a lot of people who's, who are paid to be basically immovable, 
Okay, they are, you know, if you're a lineman, your job is to basically stand there and not let anybody get past you. And if we put an extra 50, 50 pounds of meat on you, you're, uh, you're even more immovable, right? So, so this kind of shows really football players and basketball players are quite built quite differently. Basketball players, um, which are pretty extreme as far as both height and fitness, Many of them score as overweight, even though they're very finely conditioned athletes. But you can see it's nothing like the football. In football, the number of people in football that are of normal body types are a very small portion. What position do the normal body types play in football? Does anybody know? People who sprint? Okay, the runners? These guys are strong. They're fast, but they're also strong. Remember, they've got these, they've got to be able to withstand getting hit by these 300 pound, you know, blocks of meat over there. So they're pretty strong too. My money says these are the guys are the kickers. There are certain players who are kind of specialists who, you know, by law, you're not allowed to try to touch them because they will break. Okay. That if you, you know, you, 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 you tackle a kicker in the wrong way, you get a penalty, and it's a bad thing. Okay? Any questions about that? Is BMI a perfect score? No, but it's a useful one. Okay? Let's think about a scoring problem, just for you guys to make up a score. Um, suppose I wanted a statistic. You guys are all at Stony Brook. You all have transcripts. Okay? And, you know, uh, you're going to take courses. The transcript is what? A list of the courses you took and what grade you got in them. If I wanted to map your transcript to a number of how good a student you are, what would be a way to, to, write, a, a way to do it? I'd like to have a discussion. Does anyone want to propose a way to take a transcript and map it to a, 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 a score that should correlate with how good a student you are. Any idea, any proposals of how you would do this? What? Okay, so first thing I heard someone say is GPA. Is that correct? So the GPA is a score that tries to do it. Okay, where what do they do? They take, you know, an A was a four, Typically, a B was a 3, a C was a 2, a D was a 1, and an F was a 0. And you take the number of courses and you multiply them by that. Okay? Is GPA the best way to rank you guys? Desire, if I rank you guys by performance, GPA is a common statistic on transcripts to measure how good you are. Do people think that's a, the best way to do it? Is there a way you would do better than GPA? Yeah? Was there a problem with, first I maybe say, is there a problem with GPA? Yeah? Relative grading means what? Okay, so percentile grading. Okay, so one possibility would be that um, if each class gave you a uh, percentile. I gather they may do that in, 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 wait, wait, in India fairly commonly. You don't get an A, B, C. You get the five-point grade average, okay? And you could use that as a number instead of A, B, and C. Maybe that's better by some people would say. Of course, what I would say before is it doesn't really matter what the grading system is. So I don't know if A, B, C is better than um, scoring percentiles or not. But let's say we have just the, the grades, the ABC grades. Is there any better way to interpret it than just GPA? Or is GPA perfectly fine? Or can anyone see a problem with if I sort everybody by GPA? Is that going to, yeah? Some classes are hard of that, harder. Okay, there's some professors here, okay, who are real tough, tough nuts, right? And if you, got, if you get a, a B in that class, you count yourself lucky, right? Now, what, it, what, what, what should that be? Notice that 
you take it, the difference between getting it, if you got a B in that class compared to a B in a real gut class, okay, an easy class, it would look the same on GPA, right? Is there any way that we could we could normalize that? Okay, so we agree we should probably take into account the um, complexity, the, the grade distribution in each class as part of the statistic, right? Is there anything else that's going to be bad about just using GPA? Or a limitation of just using GPA, yeah? Okay, if you knew which subject was most important, you could imagine making a list that say algorithms, important, data science, very important, operating systems, don't, we don't care about that, okay? If you knew something like that, then you could come up with a better one. I'm not sure I, I'm ready to venture out there and make that kind of judgment. No, no, no. I'm saying that uh, when you take a GPA of all the classes together cumulative, you won't know where the students shine the most. Okay, so what we're, you're, we're agreeing that the transcript provides more information than the statistic. Okay, that's true, but you're not going to walk, uh, take your resume and include a copy of your transcript with it, right? You often having a summary statistic that does not provide a complete view. By definition, the reason why we have high dimensional data sets or low dimensional data sets don't completely capture it, right? But a low dimensional data set can be very, very useful if it captures most of it, okay? And that's what we would want from a scoring system. What else, anything else that's, let's say, missing if we just t take the, our, our, even our weighted GPA? Would it matter if the Okay, you're saying how, what was the grading system for the course? Okay, I don't personally feel I know whether one person's grading system is better. I tell you I'm better than Bender's. But, you know, that's, there's room to debate that, right? So I'm not sure I like that. One thing that I will say GPA doesn't cover is... Um, how many, there's probably people in this room who have a perfect GPA of 4.0 because you only took one class, right? And you compare you to somebody who got a, per, a Jeffrey GPA after three semesters. Who's the better student? There's no difference. We're both 4.0. I took CompuGut and I got my, uh, my, 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 my A. Okay, I'm a 4.0 student, right? So you would also like a statistic that would measure how much they have taken, right? Does everybody see that, that this might lead to a different scoring system that I think would be maybe more justifiable or maybe an improvement over just GPA? Any questions about that? Any other comments with that? Now, I hope I've turned you all into baseball fans, okay? I don't know if this is true or not. Um, I'm, I'm perhaps a little skeptical. But in baseball, there is a wonderful, recent, fairly recently developed statistic called WAR, which I don't know if any of you have heard, which is you want to measure how good a baseball player is, right? And baseball players do many things. They hit, some hit home runs, some hit for a high average. Some are good fielders, some are good pitchers. It would be nice if I had a measure of how good a baseball player was. Okay, and the war, which is a wins above replacement, is a statistic that's become very, very popular in baseball. What is the idea? Each player does something. Every time you hit a home run, Presumably, it contributes a fraction to a fraction of a win for the team on average. Each home run maybe gives you, you know, you know, you could kind of map a home run to say, well, a home run gives me is equivalent to winning 0.2 games. Okay, so if a team hits five home runs, they're almost certain to win the game. Let's say, and a hit, a single maybe is worth one, you know, 0 0.05 wins. Okay, you can imagine trying to map every one of the raw components to a notion of wins, 
Okay, how many wins did a player earn by their hitting, their pitching, their fielding? And in this statistic, they subtract off what's the expected number of wins that a garbage player would have. Notice that if you were, um, th there's players who were earning millions of dollars playing baseball, and there's players who, who are working at Walmart because they cannot get a job earning millions of dollars playing baseball, right? You could always hire this guy from Walmart and say, would you give up your $20,000 a year job to go earn millions playing baseball? Most of them would say yes, right? If you put somebody in, this guy in from Walmart, will he ever get a hit? If you give him enough tries, he's going to get a hit. Is he going to get a home run? If you give me enough tries, I bet you I could get a home run. Well, actually, that's probably a push. But I bet you if you gave me enough tries, I would be able to get a hit or a walk or something like that. I'd be able to do something right, right? So in this statistic, they compare you. How much did you achieve with your chances versus somebody who would have been a replacement level, a guy easily found off the street, okay, or in the minor leagues, as they would say not Walmart. And you then apply certain corrections. If I have hit a lot of home runs, but I play in a baseball park that has a very short fence, then everybody hits a lot more home runs there, right? So by doing these adjustments, you can come up with a statistic that grades each player based on what they are, how much better they are from somebody that would be basically off the street. And, and what you look at when you see this is most players are about what you can get off the street, okay? There's a small number of people who are much, much better. These are the stars, the real stars, okay? There are some, a small number of players that are worse than what you get off the street, those are the people that are, you know, married to the dog boss's daughter or something like that. That's why they keep their job, okay? Or they're, you know, there's some other reason why, okay? And they typically don't keep their job very long, okay? Is everybody going to get that idea of a statistic? Okay. And again, this is something that corrects <clears throat> for how many chances you had, okay? So <clears throat> a player who... who who played a lot should get more value than a player who didn't play very much. Just like the player who got a four point, uh, the student who got a 4.0 with 10 courses is better than someone who got with one course. Any questions about that? Okay. Fair enough. Let's, let's continue on. Um, again, the, um, when we talk about machine learning methods, <clears throat> I do want to uh, talk again and just convince people again about the difference between a what I will call a gold standard and a proxy. A gold standard, if you're typically looking to train a machine learning classifier, you want to find somebody, try to predict who's going to be a good student. You would like there to be a gold standard of good student, okay? A gold standard is something you trust. They're labels that somebody says that you assume are correct. Proxies are quantities that are not um, the exact, not really a gold standard measuring exactly what you want it to do. But it has, it's kind of a number that's easily obtained that kind of sort of does what you want to do. So for example, if I want to measure how good a student you are in general, I might very well use your GPA or your SAT score or your GRE score or something like that. Is that a measure of how good a student you are? Well, kind of, but it's not the same. It doesn't measure, those don't measure how hard you work. Let's say like the SAT score <clears throat> doesn't measure how hard you work. The GPA doesn't measure necessarily how brilliant you are, if you depending on what kind of classes you're taking and stuff like that. So just be aware that there's a difference between the things we want to measure and the things we can measure. Okay. 
And in machine learning, you sort of often assume that you got a label that's the right thing. In build in 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 a sensitive data analysis, you got to think it's it it it's you know it's not always the same thing. Any questions? Okay. If you have the same the, a gold standard, then you use machine learning. If you don't, all you can do is come up with a scoring function uh, using some of the proxies and see how well it does. Um, there's a book that I'm going to recommend. I'll talk about at the end of the semester on kind of misuse of societal misuse of machine learning models called Weapons of Math Destruction. I like that. Okay. And um, what it, it, it kind of shows is that often in society, people build models based on um, what you call it, something that they can measure and then act on it in the real world with bad consequences. The classic example is um, trying to decide, suppose the university says, I want to fire the 10% of the worst teachers we have at the university. How would you measure who is the worst teacher at the university? What are you saying? Right. So what you might say is you might say that uh, every at the end of the semester, you'll fill out teaching evaluations <clears throat> and the students will grade you on teaching evaluations, right? Maybe we fire the 10% of the teachers with the lowest teaching evaluations. Are they the worst teachers at the university? Probably not. Why else do people get low, bad teaching evaluations? If I don't give A's in this class, I can guarantee you guys are going to start, you know, marking me down low. Yeah, I learned a lot in here, but I got to be. Okay? The teacher's got to go. Okay? So everybody kind of see that there's a difference between the thing that you want to measure and the proxy. And this is why a lot of these things take judgment. And they're not automatic algorithmic things to do. When you have just an algorithm, you often come up with the wrong, wrong question. Okay, any questions? Okay, what is about scores or rankings? Remember, when you have a scoring function, if you're executing it on a universe of n things, you could assign each one of these n things a rank from 1 to n, depending upon what its position is in the in sorted order of that scoring function, right? Now, which is better, okay? Should you report the rank of somebody, or should you report the um, their score, okay? And the answer is, of course, is it depends, okay? One issue is if you're presenting these numbers to someone, which is more useful statistic in um, isolation? A rank number or a scoring a score? In college basketball teams, there is a score called an RPI. When I did this, Stony Brook was doing surprisingly well, and we had an RPI of 39.18, which made us rank 111th out of 250, 350 teams in the country. Which is a better, the, 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 a, a, a number you would rather see to understand how, how well the team was doing? Is it the RPI? Or the rank? The rank has meaning. The RPI you don't know anything about, right? What if you're interested in what the distribution of the scores is? Okay? Often people might be interested in how much better is, play, is the top team than the second best team, right? To do that, that's a question you can only care about with scores. Okay. A second, que a final question is, which is more valuable if you're interested in knowing about the middle of the distribution rather than the uh, extremes of the distribution? Okay. Suppose I tell you I rank 20, I happen to be, my uh, GPA Actually, here, your GPA is ranked 20 places higher than hers, okay? 
Now, what does that mean? Okay, does that mean the same independent of where you are? Okay, if you suppose you were ranked first, what does that mean compared? She is ranked now twentieth. Okay, is there a bigger little difference between you guys? Who here says big? We enter by who here says that the difference first and twentieth is a big difference or a little difference? Depends, but does it really depend? Okay, it depends on class size. Let's say we're talking about a class size of a hundred. Okay, difference between first and twentieth is that a big difference? Who here says yes? Who here says no? Okay, about equal, okay. What about comparing it to, suppose you rank 40th and she ranks 60th. Is there a big difference between you guys or a little difference? Little. Everyone agrees that's little, why is that true? It's because typical statistics are ranked on a bell curve, is that right? The difference between the first and the 20th is something like that, right? The difference between the person ranked 50th, 40th, and 60th, because this is the meat of the distribution, is probably relatively little, right? At the middle, typically, there is, um, you know, what you call it, a small score difference makes for a big ranking difference. Does everybody kind of see that? And again, depending upon what you want to highlight, okay, for highlighting the extremes, ranks are probably good. For the middle of a distribution, the difference in ranks is relatively meaningless. Any questions? Okay. So what makes for a good scoring function? We agree that it should be something that's easily computed. It should ideally be something that's easily understandable because you'd like to use it to describe, to defend to somebody, usually. Why are you ranking the students like this? Why are you ranking the baseball players like this? Okay. Typically, it depends upon a monotonic interpretation of the variables. You'd like to say that some variables measure good things about you and some variables measure bad things about you. And so typically scores are measured by you know, what's, if we want to measure whether you're obese, being tall is good. The taller you are is better. Your mass, the smaller it is, is better, right? Those variables get interpreted monotonically. And if you know whether what, what, what is good and what is bad, that is a good thing. You can usually check if your scoring function is meaningful by checking outliers and see how they're doing. If I had a system for ranking baseball players, do I know how it's gonna compare a mediocre player on one team with a mediocre player on the other team? Not really, except that they probably shouldn't be that different. But I do know that there are superstars that everyone thinks is a superstar, and there are obvious bums, okay? It should be the case that by looking at this, if the bums are scoring unexpectedly well or the superstars unexpectedly badly, then I have reason to question my, uh, whether my scoring system is doing what I write. And finally, it's using normalized variables in a meaningful way. Any questions? Okay, now I've mentioned this concept many times, but I think this is my first time I'm going to use a slide for it. There is this idea of a z-score, which I've talked about, okay? When you're building a scoring function from variables, it is usually important that you normalize the variable in a meaningful way. How is it that um, BMI normalized the variables? Okay, is BMI height a weight over height squared? Is that what the BMI is? Well, it's actually the weight in kilograms over the, um, what you call it, the, uh, the height in, in meters, right? 
And that's kind of a little bit of a specification of normality, right? If you didn't actually uh, describe the units, you would get a meaningless number. But um, a more general thing is to, to normalize variables based on properties of the distribution. Um, so, uh, you know, a z-score is, as we said, is maps a individual variable, variable value to, um, it subtracts the mean and divides by the standard deviation of the column. Now, what's interesting about using z-scores, okay? One thing is that um, this, you will get the same z-scores of a variable regardless of what units you measure it in, okay? So if I compare uh, the z-score of somebody's height in inches compared to miles, What's the average my, what's your average height in in um in inches in this class is probably about 65 or something like that. What's the average height in miles in this class? It's going to be something like I don't know, I don't maybe you are you look like someone who's about 0 0.003 miles is my guess in height. Okay? Now, would it be silly to measure someone in miles? Well, it doesn't, there's nothing morally wrong with it, right? But it, the important thing is that, that um, if you convert it to a z-score, it's going to measure the same kind of thing. Why is that? The mean is going to, this is going to be small, this is going to be small. The standard deviation is going to be tiny, right? So, um, so, so this is an interesting property. This is why using z-scores for normalization it's a linear transformation so things like miles to meters or something like that is just a linear transformation okay z-scores are independent of such things okay any questions the great thing about a z-score is after you compute it the values that you have will have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one okay and this means that they are all comparable in a meaningful way right and again it's kind of cool because if you have a positive z-score it means that you are above the mean if you have a negative z-score you're below the mean okay and so for interpreting data often doing a z-score is going to make it you know is, is a better way to think about a data set. Any questions? Now, sometimes students hear this and they immediately go crazy. Oh my God, I've got to take every one of my variables and take the z-score of it. Now, recognize that a z-score is just a linear transformation. On some level, when you multiply in a linear regression model, you're taking your variable and multiplying it by a constant, right? If all you've done is shrink it by a constant and then multiply it by a different constant, this linear transformation doesn't necessarily do anything that's, that's fundamentally different, right? For many of your models, taking the z-scores versus taking the original variables will not change the result at all, of the model at all. Okay, so I don't want you to go crazy here. But for trying to bring things to the different kinds of quantities to, a, to the, a similar scale, maybe for visualization, maybe for building models, maybe for merging different data sets, okay, z-scores can be very, very useful things. Any questions about that? Okay. Okay. Um... I would like a question, or, okay, let me assume what I'm going to do. Next class, I'm going to talk about um, some other uh, techniques for ranking that are more advanced. We've had this idea of building z-scores, that's just feature processing, okay? But there are methods um, that are, uh, you know, let's say more algorithmic and sophisticated for producing scoring functions than just guessing. And I'm going to try to, I'll talk about those techniques next class. 
I have a minute to go, so I'd like a question about something, so I don't feel tempted to go on now. Any question about anything? Okay, so what the z-score is, you're, I guess what you're th talking about is what happens when you compute z-scores on a data set with outliers, okay? Right. Now, one thing that's great about z-scores is that um, it, it converts every number to a, how many standard deviations from the mean is it? Now, if you have a nice bell-shaped curve, if your data is given normally distributed, okay, or even by a general bell-shaped curve, there shouldn't be points that are too many standard deviations from, from the mean, okay? So one great thing about a z-score is it does highlight outsiders, you know, outliers in a particular way. You know, at a perfect, you know, um, if it was normally distributed, anything that is more than five or six standard deviations from the mean is probably pretty weird, okay? And if it's 20 standard deviations from the mean, it's quite weird, okay? And so this is one, one reasonable criteria for identifying an out, a potential outlier. Um, again, does that mean you should remove it from the data set? Note that if you decide to throw out outliers, you probably want to recompute the mean and standard deviation of what's left for z-scores, right? Because that outlier is going to have a, dis a, 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 big a, a reasonable impact on the mean and a very large impact on the standard deviation, okay? But so, yeah, so I think that one of the good things about z-scores is that they highlight potential outliers. That doesn't mean you throw them out, but that means you think about them. Any other questions? Actually, I think now I've used up my time. So unless there's a good question, I'm going to let you guys go. Okay, good luck on the homework, and I will see you guys uh, next class. Okay? Take care. Um, I see a... Uh... Okay, so so uh, what I'm hearing, there's an interesting question here. You guys are free to not listen, but uh, there's a question that was on the... Um the, uh, you know, television about that one of the fields was an operating system build numbers. And some of them are very large. Let's think about OS build numbers. Okay, what were the ranges of the OS build numbers? Does anybody? Is a build number? What is a build number? It's a I say it's a number. Okay, but is it a number number? Or is it a number? Okay, that's okay. What does that mean? I think a build number typically means it's something that's one point. If it's let's say the first release, it was 1.0, then 1.2, then 1.3. Okay, and um, it may be if they had 10 releases, it was got 1.10, and then somebody said we need a new version, and the next one was 2.0. Should this be interpreted as a number number? Okay, what might be another way to interpret that instead of as a number number? Okay, you say as category, maybe. I might think of it uh, as another way to think of it might be you truncate it, you delete the, 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 either the individual builds are not important. Okay, in which case you make it maybe a number one, two, three for the version. Or maybe you start counting from one and you give each build is another product. That there's no difference between the difference between 1.09 and 1.10 compared to 1.10 and 2. If you believe that, then maybe you would want to assign them linear numbers. Map them to releases, right? That might be a form of processing that makes sense on this. 
It's probably not right to think of them as normal numerical features. Are release numbers going to be on a bell curve? God knows these are, you know, I don't know what they are. These aren't real numbers in some sense. They're numbers serving as labels. But the linear order does matter. And so my immediate sense would be, what if you map them to number of times the pro since the beginning of, 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 of the world, right? Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it's not, okay? But treating it like a number number is probably wrong, okay? Any questions? Yeah. Is different than what Windows build number is. So if you if you assign rank based on the ascending order of build number, you might get. Uh, okay, so there's this question of that that Mac may assign build numbers in a weird way relative to Windows. Is that the right way to redo it? Just to treat them equally? Probably not. What might be a better way to do it? What if you map each build number to the date when it came out? Now that's something that's probably. A, 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 a relatively standard thing. The real thing you care about build number, is it old or is it new? Maybe you care about, is it a 1.0 version? Maybe when you have big releases, they're more likely to have bugs and get hacked. Maybe there's a feature difference between the, the new version and something that's a mature version. Okay. So yeah, so there's different ways of thinking about these things. I agree that the number thing of them as purely numbers is wrong. What is the right way to do it? It depends. Okay, use your judgment. Think about it. Okay, but first do something simple and then think about it. Okay, good luck.